I'll collect those sheets afterwards. The reason I picked this exercise is it, in statistics, you usually have a similar situation as you want to know something, but you can't get the real answer. But up to now, think about the problems I've been giving you. I said, the mean height of men is this, and the mean standard deviation of men is this. Find this probability. Do I know what the dirty lie is? Who knows what the true mean and standard deviation is? We don't know that. So hard to ever know that, the mu and the sigma. Typically, we know sample means and sample standard deviations, and we're trying to sort out from that what can we say about the true means and standard deviations. <coughs> now, what I wanted you to start thinking about, and the topic today is sampling distributions, and this is the first time I've tried it, so it'll be interesting to see how it works. <coughs> the mean of these is not all that different, is it? 98 to 110. So if I looked at just that number, that's the mean of everything, say, oh, about 100. <clears throat> well, what else do you observe, the differences amongst the different teams, what they saw, what they observed? How about team four? The minimum is way off. Well, is it, is it an outlier? <laughs> we don't know. I can only tell as an outlier if I knew what all the data was. All I know is I made an observation, and the lowest was 35, and the highest was 154. Which of these are the most uniform? Probably team two. Which team do you believe that has the most reliable information, or most, let me say, consistent information? Because? What's another statistic that we could or should have up here to help us understand this idea of spread? Standard deviation. Standard deviation. Would that be an S or a sigma? A sigma. An S. An S. <laughs> because it's a sample statistic. We're based on a sample. We don't know sigma. This is the mean. This is an x bar. It's not a mu. We don't know what mu is. We'll never know what it is. We could calculate an s, a standard deviation, and that would be, well, I won't ask you to do that. We're going to move ahead. But this is the lowest standard deviation. All right, well, a couple points here. The first point was <clears throat> we're moving out of the realm where we're given all these, they're kind of lobbing softballs at us so far, right? Here's the mean, here's mu, here's sigma. Go calculate this probability. In the real world, forget about it. We don't know mu or sigma. We still have to make some decisions and try to calculate some probabilities and have some confidence in what we're doing. The other thing I want to emphasize is that Standard deviation variation is huge in assessing the reliability of your statistics, isn't it? Now, if you knew nothing else but those numbers, if you told the decision maker those numbers and nothing else, what would you not be telling the decision maker? Or if you were a decision maker and you're only looking at these numbers, what would you be missing? In this situation, you might be saying, well, 10 to mean, that's great, I'll plan for that. But it could have been as high as 154 or as low as 35. Which would represent the most risky scenario then, thinking of if this was a military operation? If uh, you for 110, there's 154. Not good. Well, yeah. I mean, you could always do overkill and plan for 154. But remember, this, these are zero-sum games. I put resources here, I have to take them from some other place. All right, you, but you know that stuff. All right, that's the backdrop. Now let me get into the statistics and talk about how we're going to tackle problems similar to this. And the similarity isn't in the application, but it's in the fact that 
We want to know something, but it's impossible to know it. So how do we go about making as good estimates as we can about what we want to know? <clears throat> and the key concept is a sampling distribution. And here's the idea. You were doing sampling distributions, but you didn't calculate sampling statistics. Not exactly. If I wanted to know what a parameter of a population really was, I'd take a sample. And I'd take a sample, then I'd calculate a statistic, in this case, the average or the sample mean, and that would give me a, a one value, an estimate of that parameter. I could repeat that sample again, and in that sample I could take the statistic calculate again, and then I'd have two values. So what if on your data, you took each day as a sample of three, and you calculated the mean number of observations on that day? You would have five different samples all together of size three, wouldn't you? All right, so we could be looking at a daily average. <coughs> Now what we're going to study mathematically is what can I say about the distribution of those sample statistics? What do I know about those? Is there any guarantee of where they're going? Are they going to get me closer to the real value? Can I say anything about their distribution? What shape is it? I, mean, I drew the nice bell-shaped curve there. That might be wishful thinking. It would be nice if it was, but is that the case? Because this little experiment you quickly went through is, has a lot in common with many applications of statistics. I take samples, I calculate a statistic, and I take another sample, calculate another statistic, and I accumulate these statistics to learn more about the real distribution. And key questions we have in our mind then <clears throat> is if I repeat this many times, this is the sampling procedure over there. And each one of these arrows represents taking a sample. So you think that in your example, it's a day's observations. I take that day's observations and I calculate a statistic. You would average, take the mean of those three observations in that day. And those, each of those would be an X bar, with a sample statistic. And suppose you did that hundreds of times, and thousands of times, and millions of times, and you created a histogram of those X bars, the sample means. And two things we like to know. Does the mean of these sample means get close to my true population mean? Keep in mind this separation out here. I have my sample, and it consists of X bars. And I have my population. That's my parameter that I'm interested in studying. I take the first sample, and I calculate the first sample mean. I'll call that X bar sub 1. Then I'll take another sample and I'll calculate its sample, its mean. I'll call it X bar 2. I'll continue doing that on and on and on. And then I can also calculate the mean of the sample means. Because, and here's an important concept to, to keep in mind. If X is a random variable, that X bar is also a random variable. In your experiment, X, the random variable, is the number that you observed that day, right? That's X. But if you took the average of each sample, that statistic called an X bar, that's also a random variable, right? Because it's just the sum of, of random variables. So I've got... <coughs> There is something out there, a mean, a mu of x bar, the mean of my sample means. 
And what I want to know, what I'd like to know is, is that mean equal to this mean? Is it close to it? Do I have any guarantee that I'm going to repeat this process again and again and again and again, that I'm going to get close to this guy? Because remember, this is what I'm interested in. That's what I like to know. You would think that as I do this for larger and larger samples more and more times, I should get closer and closer and closer, right? You would hope. Can we statistically, mathematically say, I can guarantee you within a certain confidence level that we'll be this close after this many samples? That would be nice, wouldn't it? There's no guarantee. We'll never know precisely if we're there, but we like to know how fast are we getting closer to it. Let me do a quite uh, slight divergence here. This concept of the mean of the sample statistic getting close to the mean of the population, if this happens, if this statistic actually tracks to this one, then it is an unbiased estimator. And that's a good thing. Uh, you can think of unbiased as the good housekeeping seal for statistics. It has a great property. It assures me that if I take large enough samples, I'm guaranteed to get closer and closer to what I really want to measure. Now, the mathematics is far more precise than that, but for our purpose, that's good enough. X bar is an unbiased estimator of mu. S squared, the sample standard deviation, is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. And P hat, the sample proportion, is an unbiased estimator of P population proportion. Now, if you're fuzzy at all at what these Greek and Latin letters mean, make sure you understand them. There's a document up on the, the lessons folder called MA106 Terms. In our next quiz, which will probably be Friday, I'll let you know for sure Wednesday, we'll have a, num we'll have a lot of vocabulary. Make sure you know what the sigmas and the s's and the p hats and the p's, the x bars and the u's mean. Distinction. You won't say it, I'm still copying the, the unbiased estimators down. I'm just copying the last okay. three down. Notes are, the notes are also on edge. <coughs> Got it. All right, well, you can imagine since I raised these questions, hopefully I have answers to them. Else, why would we be here? There are answers to the questions we just asked, and the answers come in the form of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us what we can know about the, in this particular case of the means, the sampling distribution of the sample means. I know it's wordy, isn't it? but just parse it, break it down bit by bit. The sample means, I'm taking a sample, I'm calculating a mean. The sample distribution means I'm doing that procedure many, many, many times. And if I pile all those sample means together, and I, one way to visualize that distribution is a histogram, what does it look like? The sampling distribution of the sample means. These are the X bars. I pile all the X bars up in a histogram. What shape is a histogram? <clears throat> all right. We will now have a dramatic reading of the central limit theorem. This is my second favorite lecture in 106. It's my favorite lecture in 105. This is a really incredible, amazing result. I usually ask for a drum roll before I read it. Okay, here we go. A dramatic reading of the central limit theorem. For a random variable x with any distribution, the sampling distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution as the sample size increases. In addition, the original population x has a mean equal to mu and a standard deviation into sigma. Then we have mu of x bar equals mu, and sigma x bar equals sigma over the square of n. I'll give you 
a second to catch your breath. Gas. Now again, what's mu of x bar mean? The mean of the sample means. Sigma x bar is the standard deviation of the sample means. Now I'm going to go through this bit by bit here, break it down. For random variable x, this is the part that gets confusing. Uh, whenever you're working on one of these problems, make sure you know what is the random variable that I'm working with. And is, how is it different from the sample statistic? Now keep them straight, two sets of books. X is what I've studied. And I might not know anything about the distribution of X. Just like in your little experiment, you didn't know anything about the distribution of this, right? I didn't tell you how I got these numbers. I actually got them from random number generators uh, in Excel spreadsheet. But you didn't know that. You just had a pile of numbers. Well, the central limit theorem doesn't say, well, you can apply me if the numbers come from a normal distribution. It doesn't say that, does it? It says any distribution. I don't have to know anything about the distribution of x. That's incredible. It's incredibly powerful. And if I like to make an estimate of the mean, <laughs> yeah, if we like to obtain an estimate of the mean or standard deviation of x, and X is the population we're taking the sample. <coughs> so when I when I say things like if the sample is or this the original distribution or the <coughs> the random variable, we're talking about that distribution that we're sampling from. You know, in your example, it's the sheet. And typically we have no idea what that is. <coughs> okay, I kind of got ahead of myself. For any distribution. That's the huge, amazing point. The only thing I really require is that that distribution have a finite mean and standard deviation. That's all. And yet there are pathological cases of probability distributions that have infinite standard deviations. All right, we have to forget about those, but that's not a big deal. So the central limit theorem is applicable in a variety, a huge variety of cases. Sampling distribution of the sample mean approaches a normal distribution. All right, now what's a mean approach? This is a little bit a hand waving here. If this was a 300 level course, maybe a 500 level course, we'd actually precisely say what that means mathematically. But we can uh, <coughs> avoid those gory details and say that it's a guarantee that as n gets large, distribution of the sample means approaches or gets close to a normal distribution. So that means I can use my well-known, beloved normal distribution to calculate probabilities. And I won't be off by very much. I mean, that's great news. I'm starting out with a distribution I know nothing about. But if I follow this sampling procedure, calculate sample means, I'm guaranteed I'll end up in a distribution that I know very well. Now, how large does n have to be to be close? The rule of thumb we'll use is 30. Greater than 30, practical experience for many decades has shown that you're close to a norm. And so that the calculations you do are going to be close. More detailed guidelines in a minute here. And to me, this is really the amazing thing, is that <coughs> we're ending up at a normal distribution. Regardless of where you start, you end up with a normal distribution. And you could be starting from something that doesn't look anything like the normal distribution. So let's, let's go back again, big picture. I've got my original population. Those are my x's, those are my random variables. So in your case, it's the observations. If I'm studying heights of cadets, those x's would be the height of an individual cadet. Think of this as the space of the ones, one at a time. I'm taking a sample size n, and now I have 
a space of X bars. These are means of samples. So over here. This distribution has a mu and a sigma, and I don't know what it is, but I'm interested in learning about it. Now the neat thing is I can find out about this distribution, mu of X bar and sigma X bar, and I know that this is true. The mean of the sample means is the mean of the original distribution. And the mean of the standard deviation of the sample means is sigma over square root of n. Let's see why that's good news, too. Well, let me actually pause on that for a minute. <coughs> U of x bar equals mu, sigma x bar equals sigma over square root of n. Now, why do I get excited about that? Sigma over square root of n, and it's a sample size. Why is that good news? Think about the example we just did up here. Thomas? Because we're, if not at the exact same number, we're very close to the actual limit, or same deviation. Well, what, uh, what happens as my sample size increases? You closer to, closer to the actual value for the mean. Uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're one step away from that. As our sample size increases, I'm dividing by square root of n. So as n gets bigger, this number gets smaller, so my standard deviation of the sample means gets smaller. Now we can come to your conclusion. That's good news because if my standard deviation is small, it's a higher probability that I'm going to be close to the true value. Think back to your raw data values and your observations. The one had a huge standard deviation, the other had small. When we're estimating, we want to estimate using something that has a small standard deviation. It's going to be more accurate. So this is telling us I can get better accuracy by taking larger sample sizes, and it tells me exactly how quickly I get better estimates. You can make use of that. All right. I'm going to do a really cool Java app here. I hope. It looks like the security issues have been resolved. going on behind the scenes. On the top is my original distribution. That's my x's. Okay, remember this duality we have. We have x's and we have x bars. What's that look like? What shape of distribution is that? Uniform. It's the old shoebox distribution. We're using an algorithm on this computer that gives me a uniform random variable between 0 and 10. So I'm sampling from guys that look like that. And down here it says I'm taking sample size 30, that's my n, and I've taken 1,000 samples of size 30 from this distribution. And when I do that, and then I look at the distribution of the sample means, look at the shape. I start here, the shoebox, what do I end up with? Starts to look like normal, doesn't it? That's the a graphical demonstration of the power of the central limit theorem. Now, what would happen here as, okay, that's the number of samples. Now, someone predict if I move the sample size to the left and make it smaller, what's going to happen to that shape down below? I saw figures going like that. It'll look more and more like the shape up above. And 
and obviously their sample size one, well, yeah, it's just a uniform distribution. But now watch what happens as I start to click up the sample size. And magically now, I'm getting a normal distribution. X's, X bars. Keep that in mind. X's, X bars. X bars approaching a normal distribution. We can do the same experiment up here. Now our original distribution, our X's are coming from this guy, the skewed distribution. It doesn't look normal at all, does it? Same idea. My sample size is 11. I'm doing about 4,000 samples. And after 4,000 samples, I've got something that looks normal already. That's the sample size 11. <coughs> What else will I see happen as I increase the sample size? How will the shape of this bottom distribution change? Make a prediction. It will even out. No outline, like the, the one giant one by two, it will, will be less dramatic. Open OK. Out. What else? True. What happens as that increases? Standard deviation of what decreases? Well, the x bar, so it's the standard deviation of this distribution decreases. If the standard deviation of this distribution decreases, how will the shape change? It should get narrower. And it does. Isn't it great when it actually works? Theory works. <clears throat> All right. We can also we can also do that with the bimodal distribution. X's and X bars. X's and X bars. So I encourage you to, to go play with this Java app. To me, it's really important that you get the big picture of what's going on here. This will help you in all throughout 106 because. In all this course, we're taking samples and calculating statistics, and we're looking at the distribution of those statistics. And we use the central limit theorem again and again and again, various different guises. <coughs> okay, well, how can we make use of this? Let's do an example. So we're going to study the, the weights of men normally distributed. And so x is equal to the weight of one man. And we're going to, just for convenience to get started, say that mu is 172, and that sigma is 29. What's the probability that an individual man selected at random will weigh more than 175 pounds? Now, this is the kind of problem we've done already. Right? So help me draw the picture first. Oh. Yeah, you've already done the uh, normal CDF. I want you to start with the picture. What's my graph look like? <coughs> Go ahead. Um, your graph is going to be, well, the mean is going to be 172. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be in the Bell shape curve. Uh -huh. And uh, the standard deviation of both ways is going to be 29. Mm -hmm. So this is normal. Yes. With mu 172 and sigma <coughs> equals 29. And what I have you do, you'll see I'm pretty fussy about this. In this case, I label the x axis. What is my random variable x here that I'm studying? The random variable? Yeah. It's going to be 175. Well, what physical characteristic am I studying? I'm studying the weight of one man. I know that sounds pedantic right now. It's going to be important in 
just five minutes. X equals weight of one man. So 175 is right there. The shaded area is there. And the area of that shaded area is the probability that X is greater than or equal to 175. And you have the number? Um, it is 45.8%. All right, no surprises there. We've done those. Now let's answer the second question using what we've learned already about the central limit theorem. What's the probability that 20 randomly selected men will have a mean weight greater than 175 pounds? How is that question different than the first one? Let me ask the third row there. Who's sitting to your left? Well, Roscoe, go ahead and take it. What's different from this question to that one? What changed? <coughs> Sounds like it looks like the same thing. You're only taking the, you're using a sample of 20 people. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're going to use that as your, uh, as your head. So what has changed is I'm looking at a probability distribution of an X, a single man. But what's my random variable down here? 20. N is 20. But my random variable down here is not X, it is it's an X bar. It's an X bar. So over here, and this is why uh, I insist that when you draw the graphs that you label the X axis. Now what I'm studying is X bar is the mean weight of 20 men. Take the time to write that down and remind yourself what you're studying. If you do that, you're less, far less likely to make a mistake. Here I'm studying the mean weight of 20 men. Oh, well, that's got, there must be a mu of x bar and a sigma of x bar. What is the mean of x bar, mu of x bar? Central limit there, the rescue. The Roscoe? It's going to be 175 again. Yeah. The central limit theorem tells me that the mean of this random variable, x bar, is the same as the mean of x over here, 175. It should have been 172. 172. Thank you. And sigma x bar is sigma over the square root of n, which is 29 over the square root of 20. And that is. 6.48. Actually, I drew my curve here. I should have drawn this curve differently. How should I have drawn it differently to be more accurate? Yes. Uh, a little bit taller. Yeah. I've, I've decreased the standard deviation, so the shape's going to change. It'll be taller and narrower. So I really should be more accurate. It's probably more like this. And out here is 175, and I'm interested in this area. Well, how do I find the area? Over here, this was a normal distribution. What can I assume about this distribution of the x bars? I can't, can I? Because central limit theorem says I approach normal. You know what? I mean? Yeah. What it's suggesting up here is a normal distribution to start with. So now I can assume that this distribution is also normal. So this probability is just normal CDF left, right, 175. E99, mu and sigma, 172, and 6.48. Now, before I can put that in the calculator, is the number coming out going to be greater than or less than this number? Less than. Less. It's got to be less than, doesn't it? And what is it actually? 1.322, right up there. You can read. Great. 
and that should intuitively make sense to you. The probability of having a group of 20 men with average rate greater than 175 is less than having just a single man. All right. I've covered what I need to. I'm losing my voice. We're done. I'll see you on Wednesday. And we'll